Greetings, I'm glad that you're tuning in, and I hope you're doing okay. Uh, I know last week it took us a little while to get uh, the sermon posted, and uh, apologize for that, but I should be up now. And why don't we pray as we begin and to, to look at God's Word, let's ask Him to sit with us and, uh, and to speak to us through His Word, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for uh, just the opportunity to look at your Word, and I thank you for stories that, that sometimes maybe uh, haven't caused us to think, but all of a sudden we, we maybe see them a little bit differently and, and understand them differently. And so today I pray you'd sit down with us. You'd help, you'd help us to kind of hear your word in a new way and most of all that we hear you speaking to us that that this would be an opportunity for us to actually to deepen our relationship with you lord i know that that you desire for us this intimacy with you and this ability to hear you more clearly and sometimes sometimes we hear you we just don't recognize that it's you and so i pray today that we'd recognize you speaking to us through your word help us to hear I ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. All right. Well, let me do just a short review as we look at um, as we look at what we looked at last week to kind of prep us for today. Okay. So last week we Jesus is kind of finishing this little bit of a dialogue that he's having with his disciples, um, the, and, and the way it kind of goes is he, he challenges his disciples. He says, "Hey, don't you know stumbling blocks are going to happen? Young Christians." are going to have these times where they stumble but he says whoa do not be one of those guys that cause these little ones to stumble it is not good for you and it almost sounds like um there's this this tone within it that it's not just a it's not just a oh you know you caused them to struggle a little bit but that there's this i mean it's a it's a significant stumbling place in a in a young christian's life and so we don't want to be that and so as we looked at that you know what that means is is there are things in our life that we do that we consider fine we can we maybe even defend them and or or maybe we've never even really thought through the things we do in our life and the way we live our life the way we we relax the way we entertain ourselves the way we uh just the lifestyle that we have that um that we don't consider an issue, but maybe it is an issue in somebody else's life. That we need to evaluate that. Jesus says, "Watch yourself." And then he goes on and he says, "But if if, if your brother or sister causes um, sins against you, and 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 I read that as you know, if your brother or sister caused you to stumble, here's what to do: if they cause you to stumble, go to them, rebuke them, and if if they are repentant then forgive them and if they do it again and come back and repent then forgive them and forgive them and forgive them and forgive them and and so jesus challenged his disciples with that the apostles said increase our faith now we can look at that as just disconnected from what he just said but i think that would be inappropriate i think we really need to see how connected that statement is to what jesus had just told them Jesus gave them a pretty tough command. If we realize this, it's a tough command to, to watch ourselves with the, and to let go of those things in our life that we enjoy but that might cause people to stumble. That's a difficult one. And then to rebuke somebody when they sin against you, that's hard to do. And then to forgive somebody over and over and over again, that is a difficult thing to do. And so he says, well, Jesus' response to that, increase our faith, is no. I mean, he doesn't say no, but he, in essence, he says no. He, in essence, he says, look, you have enough faith to do what I've told you to do. It, it takes the, the faith of a mustard seed. If you had that faith, the size of a mustard seed, you could command this mulberry tree to be uprooted and planted into the sea. And so what do you think that mulberry tree represented? He, that mulberry tree, I, I believe as we looked at it, it kind of represents this, this, this thing that grows in our life when we refuse to forgive our brother or sister. And so we tell ourselves, oh, that's too difficult to forgive. I'm not ready to forgive. It's, that's too hard to forgive. And Jesus goes, listen, faith is about, about obeying my commands. And it only takes a little bit of faith to do this. And what, what thing is growing in your life that you need to command to be uprooted and planted into the sea? And so what, what thing do you need to forgive that, that you just need to choose to forgive and command that thing, that thing in your life to be gone. It takes just a little faith. So he goes from there, right? And, and he talks about if you had a slave. Now, 
we understand, I, I believe, we understand that, man, that's kind of tough language. I mean, who, who wants to be considered a slave, right? Some, but somewhere in this picture, as what we talked about last week, is we have to incorporate this, this picture into our understanding of our relationship with God. You know, we, can, we, we probably gravitate towards this idea that we're a friend of God, right? I mean, sometimes we even sing that song. It's been a while, but we've, seen that, we've sang that song. I'm a friend of God, right? He knows my name, uh, these, these intimate picture of us and God. I, I had one person say, well, you know, I, I think the, the element that maybe you, you just, you, you maybe didn't needed to include was, you know, partner, partner. And I, you know what? Those are great illustrations. Those are great um, words for our relationship with God. But somewhere in this description of our relationship with God and who God is, we, God, Jesus gives us this picture of slave. And it's not easy to get around, but somewhere we have to, we, can, we don't throw out friend of God. We don't throw out partner. We don't, we don't say, well, if, he's, if we're his slave, then we can't have that. No, 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 no. We have to figure out how to incorporate all of these pieces. Because Jesus did say, I, I no longer call you servants, I call you friend. And so we have this element, but we have this other element. And it's hard to fit them all together. It really is. But we need to. Because what, what Jesus tells us is, is, is this the way you would treat a slave? I mean, that, that, that you would expect to serve your slave, and then maybe he could serve you? No, uh, we need to understand, our, as, a, as our perspective, just like any other slave owner would do, our perspective is, God says, hey, this is what I need from you. This is what you need to do. And he tells us that when a slave comes in from the field, you wouldn't say, oh, sit down, put your feet up, let me feed you. He would say, prepare my food, prepare yourself, and wait on me. That's what a slave owner would do, and that's what, that's what we are expected to do with God. When he commands us to do something, we don't make negotiate, it is his command, this is, this is what he expects us to do. And as a good slave, he adds this last part, as a good slave, you would say, I, I am an unworthy slave. I've only done my duty. Okay, we connect that with what Jesus had just said about um, not being a stumbling block and uh, rebuking and, and forgiving and then that increasing our faith to command that thing in our lives to be uprooted and planted into the sea. And, and do you hear what he's saying is, is, hey, 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 just do what I've told you to. I mean, that sounds harsh and I don't mean it to be that harsh, but, but Jesus is kind of, it's kind of saying this, this thing, okay? Now, we go from there, and we transition into this next story, all right? Now, I want to challenge you that, that we don't let go of what Luke 17 has been say, telling us so far, what Jesus has been saying in this chapter so far. But, but let's add to it. Now, this is the next piece of the story. Now, it's, Jesus has kind of ended his conversation with his disciples here, all right? And so as we move on, let's, let's go ahead and read. We're going to read nine verses today, uh, Luke 17, nine, 11 through 19. So let's go ahead and read it. It says this. Now, in, in his, on, his, in, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was get, going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Well, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? We're all, we're, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Okay, so as we look at this passage, right? There's, just, there's several things in, in there that I noticed, and I'm just going to kind of list them off. I'll, I'll kind of go into a slight, tiny bit of detail, but I'm just going to list some of these things off. And as we list them off, if there's one that kind of captures your attention, if there's one that you're like, oh, man, that, that seems like there's something there. Let's just picture that as like a treasure map, and that is an X for you. That's that place to dig. And maybe I would challenge you as, 
is, is don't, just, don't just move on. When the sermon's done, I would challenge you, hey, take some time. Look into that spot. Maybe that's, there's a treasure there that, that God wants you to discover, okay? But, so let's just list off some of the things that, that, that are there in the story, okay? The first thing I want us to see is this, that, that Jesus was traveling between Samaria and Galilee, okay? So Jesus was traveling between Samaria and Galilee. There is something distinct about the location Jesus and his disciples are in, okay? He's headed to Jerusalem. Luke reminds us of this. And as he's headed to Jerusalem, we think about this. Where's he headed? He's going because the Passover is coming up. And he's going because he knows that it's, it's going to be time for him to, to be the sacrifice. It, and in that decision, in that process of being the sacrifice, he also is taking his throne. But as, as Jewish men and women are headed to Jerusalem to present their sacrifice at Passover, which was one of those things they did at Passover, they needed to make sure they were clean. They needed to make sure that they were ready and prepared. If you showed up in Jerusalem and you were unclean, you wouldn't be able to present your sacrifice, which is a big deal. All right, So um, they had to remain clean. They would have, uh, Jewish people would have at that time would have been distancing themselves from places where they were considered unclean. That's what Samaria was to a good Jew. A place that's unclean. Samaria was a place to avoid, not a place to, to travel along. So it's interesting that, that Luke makes this point that they were traveling along get the border of Galilee and Samaria on his way to Jerusalem. We may hit on that in a little bit, all right? But, but the next thing I want us to see, there were, there were 10 lepers who found each other, right? Now, it should cause us to go, huh, that's interesting. 10 of them were all kind of together. Misery loves company, maybe? I don't know. But there seems, that seems like, you know, that seems like a lot of lepers. In fact, I would almost go, man, whoa, I, let's, <laughs> that's a group of people we want to stay away from. Leprosy was incredibly contagious. And so to have, you know, one leper was scary, but have 10 of them gathered together, that would be a group that you really did want to avoid. One might be manageable, but 10 is overwhelming. But we do know this. They were, they were abiding by the law, right, to some degree, because, because they were outside of the city. They were, they were isolated. When you contracted leprosy and the priest determined that you were unclean, you would have been cast out of the city, cast away from your work, your job, your family, everything. This is what the, the law required. And you can find that in Leviticus 13 and 14 if you want to find out what exactly needed to happen. But a priest would, a priest would have deemed you unclean and they would have been cast out. Even the Samaritan was cast out. All right, so, so what we see is they're not just all Jews here in this group of lepers. In fact, you're almost countryless. You're almost, you've, you're almost a place, a people without a home now. And you've got this little group of 10. Somewhere along the way, they must have desired community. And so they gathered together. But, but leprosy was a death sentence, health-wise. But it was also a death sentence um, in that you were removed from your family and friends. So in the, in the, you see this, there, there must have been this desire for community here. And so they gathered together. And they stood at a distance, is what we're told, right? And this is exactly what they were supposed to do. Now there's another incident, instance where Jesus encounters a leper, right? But he wasn't distancing himself. And many times the unclean uh, that Jesus had encountered... Uh, ignored the law. They were, they were found in the crowd. You think about it, though. The, the, the woman that had been bleeding for seven years, she was unclean. And she's in the crowd, and she reaches out and touches Jesus. We find the guy with the shriveled hand in the synagogue. Well, his shriveled hand would have been a sign that he was unclean. And yet, where do we find them? We find them within the crowd. But these ten, these ten were standing outside the city, distancing themselves. They had gathered to the, each other together. Now, so there were ten lepers who found each other. Let's move on. 
the ten called out in a loud voice, and one, when he re- came back, praised God with a loud voice. We're gonna, I want that one to be one we probably touch on. But I want us to see the same words, same language. The, they, they called out to Jesus in a loud voice, and this one came back and praised God in a loud voice. All right? So they were cleansed. I want us to see this. They were cleansed when they obeyed. All right? So what it tells us, the story tells us, Jesus says, go see the priest. And when they turned to go to do what Jesus told them to, that's when they were cleansed. There's a connection between the command and the, and the cleansing. Jesus didn't say, be cleansed or be healed and then go show yourself to the priest. He said, he just skipped that part. He said, go, go show yourself to the priest. It seems like a simple command, but, but let's just think through that for a moment, all right? These guys had been rejected. This, the priest is the guy who determined they were unclean. And when Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest, they were still unclean. They were still dealing with the effects of leprosy. Leprosy, not only is, does it have a skin disease, but it damages nerves. And when it damages those nerves, it creates this problem that they don't have feeling in their extremities, in their body parts. could be ears, nose, uh, hands, legs, feet. And what would happen is, is they would, they would cause damage to their body parts and they wouldn't even know it. And eventually it would cause so much damage that, uh, it, and the, the skin disease itself would, would be eating away the flesh. So between the two things, they, they would lose body parts. And so here they are with their condition, right, of issues physically, and Jesus goes, go show yourself to the priest. It would have been easy, honestly. It would have been easy for them to go, I'm, why? What's the point of going showing myself to the priest? It's obvious that I'm still unclean because, I mean, I'm missing fingers. I'm missing, I got the, my nose is a problem. So, you know, they, the act of turning to go to the priest was an act of, of obedience and a, and a step of faith. They had, they had enough faith to they, uh, to receive this miracle because they did what he told him to. It would have been easier to, to be healed than commanded to go. And we need to recognize their faith here. They were commanded to do something and they did it. And it would have been a difficult task because they hadn't experienced the healing before they turned to go show themselves to the priest. All right? So as we move on, let me make sure we see this amazing thing in the story. Because, you see, we could just, we could, we could kind of skip over it. In fact, it's, it's not even the central point of our story. But I, we cannot miss this. Okay? Jesus heals ten lepers by sending them to the priest. Do we get that? How? I mean, how significant this is. I mean, this was the disease of diseases in those days. There was no cure. In fact, we haven't even had a cure except for the last several you know, decades. This is something that, that plagued mankind for a while, and it was, you know, the mother of all diseases, maybe you could say, and here it is. Jesus goes, yeah, go show yourself to the priest. And as they turned, they were cleansed. Who did the healing? It was Jesus did the healing. <laughs> Can we please not miss this? Isn't, isn't he awesome? I mean, isn't that amazing? The most deadly disease, and here Jesus just simply goes, it's gone, go. See, I want us to... I want us to not miss how awesome Jesus is here. Because 90% of them missed it. That's a pretty significant number to miss it. So as we keep looking at this story, 
within that lung, that 90% thing, only 10% responded the way they should have. Do you see that? That, that it, Somewhere in this story, there's only one guy out of the 10 that responded in a way that Jesus acknowledged, that Jesus said, hey, what, what happened to the other nine? So the 10% of them responded the way they should have. One guy out of, out of 10. Now, we keep looking at the story and we see Jesus asked questions he already knew the answer to. Right? We're not all ten healed. He knew that. He knew the answer. Where are the other nine? He knew well, the answer to that, but he still asked the question. He wanted the audience, he wanted his disciples and us to notice this. Okay? He wants us to see all were cleansed. Why do you ask a rhetorical question? Because you want to show your intelligence? No, but because you want your audience to, to acknowledge something, to recognize something. And so Jesus asks the question, not so the one guy who came back notices that he's the only one, notices that everybody was healed. He wants us, the audience, he wants his disciples to, to notice this. All were cleansed. All of them received something from Jesus. All of them experienced a miracle. We need to see that. Now we keep looking at the story, right? The one who returned, he was a Samaritan or a foreigner. Twice Jesus highlights this. Or, or, or Luke shows us this, right? Twice. He's a Samaritan, he's a foreigner. Don't overlook this point. The original crowd in, in, in this story, the original crowd would have been like, what? The Samaritan came back? And the, Luke's audience, when he wrote this, or his original audience, they would have been like, what? This is a bombshell for them. What we see is only one guy did what, what should have been done, right? I mean, the, the whole Samaritan thing, we don't, we, don't, we don't see the significance there, but they would have. We just see it as, oh, one guy, you know, he was from another country. He, he turned around. This is the least likely, I mean, to the crowd, to the audience of Luke's writings here, this was the least likely guy. This is the guy who shouldn't have got it, and he's the only one who did get it. He was the, the least special, the least educated, the least um, aware of, of who God is, and here he's the one. He's the one who got it. And, and, and because it's repeated, Samaritan foreigner, it seems to me that that is an issue in the story, that it is something that, that we're supposed to go, huh, look at that. Hmm, there's something there. Okay? Remember, remember what I said. We're not going to touch on all of these, but I think it is an, it's, it's there to, to notice for a reason. All right? So now the next thing we see is, was the one who turned back disobeying Jesus' command. Okay, now, now it depends on how you read the story, but there's something, when I read this story, there is something in me that goes, ah, but, but Jesus told him to go show himself to the priest. And he, instead, turned back. Now, some of us, I'm sure, read this as, as though, they w so they all went, they showed themselves to the priest, and the priest, and only one of them, after that was over, came back to Jesus. I don't read it that way. If you look at it, what it says is, right? As they turned, they were cleansed. But then Luke tells us, right? When this one saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus. Now, it could be that they went to the priests, that all, all of them went to the priest, that even this one guy went to the priest. But as I read it, what I see is there's something happened as they were going to see the priests that this one guy said, it's gone. I've got to go. I've got to go back to see Jesus. And, and so what I wrestle with is so was he being a disobedient if he didn't go to the priests? Until we remember something. There was something in the Samaritan that recognized something that, that, that was playing out here. 
And there's something that Luke's wanting us to see, I, I really do believe, is he wasn't a disobedient because he is our high priest. There was a recognition of Jesus being the Messiah. I mean, they called, him, they called out to a master. Did you catch that? I just kinda, we just kind of zipped right across it, but we go back just a little bit and we think context and we're called slaves. That means he's master. They called out, master, have mercy on us. So there, there wasn't a recognition of at least there was something about him, right? And the one fulfilled Jesus' command because he is the high priest. When the Samaritan returned to Jesus, he fell at the feet of the high priest and he, and he knows that, it is, that, that, he's, that there's something special because he threw himself at Jesus' feet. And we find that phrase only like one other time in Scripture, and it's, and it's this, this acknowledgement of being in the presence of God. That statement is used only one other time, and it represents a falling at, Jesus, at God's feet. And then Jesus says something. He says, your, your faith has made you well. There's something different about this one guy than the other nine. They all received the miracle. They all you know, had enough faith to turn and go to the priest. But this one guy, his faith, it's something different. All right? So we see in this short story, as we look at this, right? We see in this short story, we see three terms that, that are kind of all connected to miracles. Okay, the first term we see is, right, they, they were cleansed. Now, did you catch this? There's three different terms we see this, through this. They were cleansed. So as they turned to go to the priests, they were cleansed. That's the term used for what happened, the miracle they experienced. So as they're going, one of them sees that he's healed. Ah, there's another word. They were healed healed okay and, and and i would assume this that that all 10 were healed and jesus asks the question we go back just a little bit we'll go ahead a little bit farther jesus asked the question we're not all 10 cleansed right but we do know that when one when the one guy saw that he was healed now cleansed has to do with spiritual um uh, acceptability all right so cleansed meant when they contracted leprosy they were considered unclean they were brought out of community. They were distanced from the community. They were unclean. That isn't, that isn't necessarily just a physical uh, picture. That is a, uh, a spiritual picture as well. Because they were, they were now needing to be separated because unclean was not presentable to God. But they were cleansed. And then Healed. And the way I would understand this, when he saw he was healed, in other words, something happened in all of them that was more than just this, they were now clean. That, that as they were clean, right? They, and they were going to present themselves to the priest. If the priest was going to pronounce them clean, and that's what the priest would have done, is pronounce them clean, then, um, then they would be brought back into community. They would have, the priest would have had to see something that told them they were clean. And if they still had sores, if they still had, you know, physical ailments connected with leprosy, then they wouldn't have been considered clean. clean. And so when he sees, that's the physical eyes, he sees that he's healed, so cleansed, so they were cleansed. And their physical bodies were healed. But Jesus tells them, your faith has made you well made well okay so we have three terms that we see in here cleansed healed made well now we can just lump them all together but i really do i want us to see that that that, that there was different words selected for each one of those things and that made well can be translated in other places of scripture as saved or salvation 
And, and maybe what the best thing we say is, is Jesus says, your faith has salvationed you. And we're going re- to kind of return to those words a little bit, okay? Uh, but, but for now, let's just notice the three dif- distinct things there that happened to one leper. Cleansed, healed, made well, saved. Okay, so those are just the, the things, if we, as I read through it, those are the things that just kind of pop out at me in this story. All right? that, and and we don't, we're not covering all of them, but I see them as significant things. But as we look at it, there's just a couple things I want us to notice. All right? So I, I want to ask the question as we begin. So who came to who? Right? I mean, I, if we just casually read it, they just encountered each other. All right? Or we could think of the other stories we have of Jesus and his healings. And, and what we see is other people came to Jesus. They, they heard he was in the area. They heard he was near. And so they went to him to be healed. Over and over again, we see people went to see Jesus to be healed. But do you hear how Luke presents this story? But Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. And he's traveling along the border between Galilee and Samaria. A place that probably was not the wisest place to travel if you wanted to remain clean. It probably, I mean, we could think, well, it was maybe the most direct route to Jerusalem. Maybe it was, right? And maybe it was the easiest route to Jerusalem. But I choose to to see it just a little bit different. What we're told is as they entered into this city, these ten lepers called out to Jesus. It's almost as though, it's almost as though this is where the ten lepers stayed because that's where they would have stayed because how would you get food when you're a leper, right? Wander around in the wilderness? Well, you're not well. You have body parts that are struggling. Transportation would not be easy. So you would hang out in a place that people would still be able to provide and give. You stay near, but, but outside. So why was Jesus there? See, I don't believe that Jesus just accidentally went places. I mean, through his life, everything seemed to be kind of directed, intentional. And so... As I look at it, I go, what if? I mean, just what if Jesus actually was going this way because he was wanting to encounter these ten lepers? We could assume, we could assume that they heard about him and and they were, you know, they, they, they caught up with him. They came out to meet him. I think that gives us humans too much credit, right? I mean, I I honestly think nine of them don't deserve much credit at all. So I choose to see this detail as Luke kind of seems like he's cluing us in. If you look at it this way, right? It seems like Luke's hinting at something. Jesus, he tells us locations sometimes. He doesn't other times. Why? Well, maybe, just maybe because he wants us to notice something about the location and maybe what he wants us to notice is is that jesus was in a strange place when he shouldn't have been because he was headed to jerusalem and maybe he was there for a purpose and one of the things that happens while he's there is that he encounters these 10 lepers and so i choose and you don't have to but i choose to 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 see it this way okay Jesus came to the lepers. Not the lepers coming to Jesus. Okay, so so is it possible? Would you be willing to maybe just entertain this thought for a moment? that, That Jesus was traveling where he was traveling on his way to Jerusalem because he had a an appointment. And so he came to these ten lepers. And he brought a miracle. That's how I read it. And, and 
And that shapes how I see the rest of what happens here. And in fact, it shapes how I apply this to my life. Okay, so let's move on. Number two I want us to just kind of focus on is, is the one man returned to Jesus. There is something in this story, right? Can we at least admit that there's something in the story that we should be paying attention? This guy, there's something there we're supposed to notice. He was, he was already cleansed and healed when he returned to Jesus, Right? Jesus had, had come to the lepers, but only one returned to Jesus. Only one came back to Jesus. It, it feels like there's, I mean, maybe it's just me, but it feels like there's something there. I mean, it feels like that we're supposed to go, oh. In fact, that, word, that phrase, only one came back. It seems like that that centerpiece to the story. I mean, yeah, Jesus healing 10 lepers, that's, that's a huge thing, but is that really the, is that the point of the story? See, as I look at the story, what seems, if, if we get right to the heart of the story, what we see is the, the thing that we need to notice is that one leper came back. 10 lepers had enough faith to receive a miracle. The ten lepers had enough faith to go to the priest, and as they went, they were cleansed. They had enough of something that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call faith. But only one has faith that causes special attention. And only one has faith that brings a different result there's something that happened to that one leper that the other nine did not experience. There is this next level that he got that the other nine didn't. Could it be that there's a message in there for us? That there's, that's what we need to notice. There is, something, there is something that that one leper did, had, that was different than the other nine. And he experienced something that was, that was next level. So as we look at that, right? Jesus said, your faith has made you well. That same word that, that we translate as faith, and we talked about it a few months ago, I mean, a few weeks ago, piston or pistis. It, it can be translated, well, it can be either one of those. Those two words get used both time, in, in either instance. It gets translated as faith. But that word also shows up in the fruit of the Spirit. And in the fruit of the Spirit, one, that word is translated faithful or faithfulness. Okay? So what if, what if we just look at it this way? All ten had faith, but only one had the faithfulness to come back. They all had enough faith for, to receive a miracle, but there's one that had in, more faith, and he was made well. Remember the difference? All ten had enough faith to be cleansed, one had faith, had something more, and he was made well. Seems like there may be this lesson that not all of us are going to get. Not everyone who has an experience with Jesus, not everyone who has an experience with Jesus is going to experience all that Jesus has to offer. Do you see what happens? This one guy experienced something different than the other nine did. They, he got something else, that, that Jesus gave him something more than the other nine. The other nine were cleansed, they were healed, but only one was made well. It's hard for me to ignore that percentage too. All right? So there's something in that, isn't there? That he came back and he got something different but look at that percentage one out of ten I wonder how many of us Christians are like the one leper and how many of us are like the nine only one of them recognized Jesus for who he is now, it'd probably be wrong to conclude that only 10% of, of us Christians 
recognize Jesus for who he is. But it could be. Maybe we could at least say this. Is it possible that most of us will miss that extra? Could it be that, that what we need in this story is that phrase that just sits in the center of it that we need to, we need to grapple with a little bit, we need to wrestle with and, and, and figure out what does this mean? What do I, what do, I do with this? What if, that, what if that centerpiece that we need to see, that we need to grab a hold of is came back? He returned to Jesus. That's what one of them did. And he got something more than the nine did. So let me put it this way. This part isn't in your notes. The last part will be, but this part isn't in it. Faith will get you started. Faith will get you started. But faithful will allow God to finish what he started in you. Okay, so remember, the same word, his faith, your faith has, has made you well. Your faithfulness has made you well. What you did different than the other guys is what makes you well. The others had faith, but you have faithfulness. Faith will get you started, but faithful will allow God to finish what he started in you. See, faith isn't finished until it is faithful. Okay? Faith isn't finished until it is faithful. So we kind of look at this with the center part of the story, and we see that that come back. He came back. He returned. The last piece that we're going to just briefly touch on is context. Context, all right? If we'll just take a moment and kind of step back and take a bigger picture look at Luke 17. Luke seems to bring these two stories together. Now, we could just think, oh, well, you know, he's, he was just randomly pulling these stories together, or he's just he's chronologically laying out the, the ministry of Jesus, but, but we should know something. Chronology in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, aren't always the same. These stories aren't always put together the same way because the authors were wanting to make sure that we noticed something. And it was helpful for them and us, and, and us if you group certain parts of the story together so that you see what we're, they're trying to communicate. Now, this, this story can be just, you know, just another story of, of Jesus' life. Well, he was headed to Jerusalem, you know, and, and he met with his disciples and he talked to them about this. And then, you know, they were going to, through Galatia and Samaria and, and this happened. Or we can say, you know what? There's something about what Jesus got done saying to his disciples and apostles that connects to this story. You see, what it, what it, what it seems like to me, as I kind of process in my inner self, that first part, right? Stumbling block, uh, rebuking and forgiving and faith and uprooting the mulberry tree and then slave and being an unworthy servant, just doing our duty. There is something that Jesus seems to be addressing. There's this something that Jesus is addressing, a huge barrier that many of us could struggle with. And the question is, will I act in faith? Will I be faithful Well, we understand that, that when we change our lifestyle and when, we're, when we rebuke, when we forgive our brother and sister, that we are we're simply, we're simply unworthy servants doing our duty. And we see this one guy come back from 
after he's cleansed. And Jesus says, that's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. That is faithfulness. There is something clearly different about this guy. In some way, it is connected to what Jesus has been teaching his apostles. Not being a stumbling block, rebuking, forgiving, taking on the identity as God's slave, that he owns us, that everything we have is his. Which brings me to this place of Christ's formation in us. Come, came back, or returned. There's, a, there's the message in there. What, what it seems like we're he- I'm hearing is this. All God asks for is that we return what He's given us. All we ask for, all He asks for, is that we return what He's given us. The one came back, praising God in a loud voice fell at Jesus' feet. Who went to who? Jesus came to them. The one leper came back to Jesus. It is a whole lot easier to give something back that wasn't yours to begin with. When you know whose it is and where it came from. Ah, you hear that slave conversation? now, Now look, we recognize that Jesus came to them. And so for that leper to come back to Jesus, to return to Jesus, it's easy for him to come back to Jesus. Because he knows where he was before Jesus. It's easy for him to offer himself to Jesus because he knows who he was. He knows that he was nothing before Jesus. Not only was he a leper, but he was also a Samaritan. And he's the one that Jesus focuses on. God expects a return on what what he's given us. To come back, to to return. It's what a master expects of a slave. Now, let's just play this out for a minute. I mean, let's think through this. Well, the greatest commandment that, that we're told, Jesus helps us with this. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Love God with all your heart, and strength, mind, and strength. That's what he expects of us. That's what he commands of us, that we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know what we find out? And we love him because he first loved us. Do you hear that? All, all he's asking, that's all he's requiring of us is that we return what he already gave us. Love God with all your heart's mind and strength. You'll love me because I loved you first. We are called to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. What did he offer for us? He offered himself as a living sacrifice for us. What does he want in return? What he requires of us is only to give back what he's given us. We look at what he's calling us to. We look at the beginning of chapter 17. Has he forgiven us? Has he been at all bitter towards us? No. Does he rebuke us? Absolutely. Is he ever a stumbling block? 
No. He has given everything for you. What are you returning to him? So the question of, quest of the questions that I have, one of them is this. Will you be the one who comes back? Now, I want us to recognize something. There's something different about this than just, well, I'm a Christian. No, have we come back to him? See, the one who, who not only has faith, but who has faithfulness. The one who, who, he's calling us to be one who not only has faith, but who is faithful. God will never, God will never take something from you that wasn't his to begin with. That would be stealing. <laughs> God's not going to steal. What he requires of us is only what he's given to us. When we stop returning when we stop returning to him what he's given us, we're like the nine who just disappear into the background. There's something more that he has for us. I, I want us to see that, that leper do something special. I want us to see that's what, that's what we're called to. If you don't think you have it in you, remember, it was the Samaritan who came back. As I think about that, that difference in that one guy, there's part of me that goes, that's a big deal. That's, that's a big change in me. Some maybe would even say that's a mountain in me that needs to change. That's why we call it Christ's formation in us. I can spend a lot of time, here's the deal, I can spend a lot of time complaining to God. But my praise of Him is lacking. See, the difference that I see in the story, I take and I take and I take and I take and I rarely return. We look at the story and, 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 and we could take the easy fruit, all right? Right? Oh, the guy who had a special faith and, and how shameful that, that it was a Samaritan. And, but there is something deep inside of me that asks, am I the one or the nine? Have I been acting like the nine or have I been a, am I living like the one? Do, and the question then becomes, do, do I want to be the one or the nine. And the difference between them is the one came back. It is Christ in you that calls out to be the one instead of the nine. It's him calling you for you. It's calling his formation in you. It is him in you that brings you back. It's him in you that that returns I want you to notice Luke used the same words to describe the ten leopards, lepers when they approached Jesus same words as when the one returned it was a loud voice they, the ten cried out in a loud voice Master, have mercy on us. The one returned in a loud voice, praising God. Did you hear that? Same word. Same word. Makes me ask the question, is your praise of God as loud as your request of God? Is your praise of God as loud as your request of God? That's the difference that Jesus is wanting to show instead of instead of complaining are we praising I learned a new term this, this week I kind of like it complaining in other words in our prayers are we just complaining complaining instead of complaining we're 
called to be returning or praising. Is there a leper in our hearts that isn't returning? I mean, we could talk about we could talk about different areas that we return to him. But whatever he has given us, however he has blessed us, whatever he does to provide for us, whatever miracle he brings into our life, are we returning it? Look, that concept plays out all the way through Scripture. We could go to even tithing and see it. Everything we have is His. Are we returning it to Him? He's calling you to be the one who keeps coming back. Which are you going to be? Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you for conviction. God, I pray that you speak to every one of us that we can put our finger on what is that thing that you're calling us to return? What are those things that we're not returning? Where are we complaining rather than praising? Would you show us that if our praise of you is, is quieter, on our request. Would you transform us? I pray that we would be like the leper who returned to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you so much for tuning in and... uh, Hey, once again, uh, I love the comments, okay? Um, I don't, I, just to know that you're out there, that's all, all right? Even if it's just a comment of, I'm here, I, I love it. Thank you so much. Well, have a great day, all right?